On the left is John McManus. John has been organising the campaign uh, from an office in Albany Street in Glasgow along with Paddy. And John, like Paddy, is from a trade union background, both of them, and both of them would have been, I think, the same trade union as myself. <laughs> because of, anyway, uh, John McManus. You know, when I first met Paddy, people thought we were scared mongering. Thought Paddy was scared mongering. Nobody wanted to listen when he came out about the amount of innocent people in jail. But well, I tell you then, see what happened then, see the amount of people in prison in this day and age in this country, it's got a lot, lot worse. And people are going to have to wake up and wake up quickly. We're under a terrorist alert. We'll see all the laws that they're bringing in here. See once the terror alert goes away and Iraq's finished and we're not going to start blaming the Muslims for everything. They ain't going to take their laws away. The laws are going to stay in place and they're going to affect each and every one of you. I guarantee it right now, there's nothing sure of the way this government, and both the Conservative and this new government, the way they're going. Two years ago, we could, just recently I got, I got uh, prison reform trust statistics. And this is just a general understanding of what's going on in this country at the moment. A, the prison population, by the way, has doubled since I first met Paddy in England. It's went from 38 to 40,000, it's now at 8,000. Uh, Jack Straw, Andy Leblanc, and Neil Clark have both said that they're hoping, well, they're never put the word hoping, I'm putting that in, but they're expecting the prison population to reach 100,000 in the next five or ten years. That will be treble, and the crime rate is not going up in this country. Now, in 2003, of the prison population, 80,000 is also flowing, they don't do quite a year, it's been 8 and 100,000 people have been held in British prisons every year. Of that, there's 58,700 in 2003 who were being held on remand. Technically innocent. Obviously, not all of them are innocent. Some of them are evil bastards and should be locked up for a long time. I have no qualms about it. But of the 58,000, well, just under 58,700 that were innocent, just under 59,000, half of them, when they get to trial, are getting a non custodial sentence. 22% of them are being acquitted. They are not miscarriages of justice, even though we know guys have been held for two years on remand in one of their, their, their trial. They're not miscarriages of justice. The average uh, time spent in remand under these statistics is 50 days. Well, that would be charging them for two months prison time. That works out to over £260 million a year has been spent on locking people up who are either innocent of a crime or don't deserve a custodial sentence. They're getting non custodial sentences. So, what happens to the other 16,000 who are found guilty and going into the main prison population? What happens to the ones that appeal that? I mean, we don't have stats for that. We don't know how many hundreds are going to win their appeal, but maybe after four or five years in prison, they win their appeal. It's a due process of law. You ain't a miscarriage of justice and don't expect any compensation or any help. It's the ones after that that we pick up. And this is what I learned from Paddy. I mean, I was down here a number of years ago for people that live in this area. Uh, a guy got out of prison, Patrick Nichols, I don't know many of you have heard of this case. He was 16 years of age. He had done for the murder of a woman in uh, Worthing in 1975. The policeman who was the first policeman on the scene of the crime, uh, Laurie Finlay, who was unfortunately now dead, uh, he, well, along with the pathologist, stated the woman had died of a heart attack. He was on a long-term case. He was taken off. He was away for a couple of months. By the time he came back, two other coppers had decided that this was murder. And all of a sudden, Patrick Nichol spent 23 years in prison. Laurie Finley didn't speak up until about five, five or six years before Paddy got out, and that's because his wife had died. Laurie Finley told us, just after, when he pulled up the two coppers, that this is, was an accidental death, what he's doing charging this guy. Laurie Finley on his way home, and this is living here, in this area, was driven off the road by the two cops, a gun put his head and told him, you don't shut the fuck up, we're going to blow you away and who's going to look after your wife then? So Laurie Finley kept his mouth shut until his wife died and then spoke out publicly. And Patrick Nichols won, won his appeal at 69 years of age. Another case was John Kamara, who Satish mentioned that I met through Paddy. John Kamara came from Liverpool. John Kamara, the hell, we found out, once again, it's a, a and you'd think it was written in a movie script. You know, a CCRC worker writes to the, the department, we're looking for some. She had a whole list of documents in John Kamara's case, and as she was looking through it, she realised it was about eight pages missing. You know, usual. So 
So she wrote, I'm looking for these eight pages. Could you send them to me? Oh, up, and then the others. Huh? And then the others, up two boxes came with over 200 statements that never been shown to the defence. Some of the statements were actually from a headmaster who was interviewing John Kamara about his uh, niece on the time of the, the man's death in Liverpool. The, the man whose father, uh, the victim's father, is Melba John Kamara, and they got together and they were asking for once again for the original killer to be caught. And as I say, the prison population has doubled. In all these cases we are talking about, no one's ever been held responsible. No one is. We've got another case, Robert Brown, spent 25 years in prison. They kept him in 10 years long. We'd only got two and a half years ago. They kept him in 10 years long because we didn't miss guilt. It was the strangest appeal I've ever witnessed in my life. And I, I, I don't, I've not been in many trials. I'm going to talk about one later on, but I've not been in many trials. I go to appeals. And it was Paddy that used to drive me along, and my God, if you need a sleep, go in a peel, because within five minutes you're out. Almost as like, look at it, my in the room, you're out. The tone they talk in, the language they talk in, we are not meant to understand. I used to walk out of the court after about three years ago, go to that bit. And Paddy, within about two minutes, would go bang, 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 and I'd say, that's what they were talking about, all that, that's what they were saying, and that's what it's like. What we could say in three sentences, they take three hours to take, say, just to put the blinkers down to us so we don't take them in board. Robert Brown's appeal. Robert Brown put in nine petitions to seven home secretaries from something like 1985 to 1992, and not once would we send it back to the appeal court. See, when Robert Brown's case went back to the appeal court in November 2002, the Crown didn't even challenge the appeal. I mean, think about that. They, do, they wouldn't send the case back to the appeal court. And then when they do send the case back to the appeal court, they don't challenge it. The reason why they never challenge it is because of a document that we still can get our hands on called the Talking Report. Peter Talking was a, a policeman who actually convicted uh, Myra Henley of being Brady. You know what I mean? He was a cop that did his job. He was asked to do a, a, a undercover investigation at the Clapham Police Station in 1979 in Manchester. And from that investigation, he discovered, and his words were, Detective Inspector Jack Butler, this is the policeman that Robert Brown always stated beat him up. Jack Butler was one evil bastard, and anyone from Manchester in that age group would know him. Maybe over 40 years of age would know the name Jack Butler. He was evil. Peter Topping actually says he was, he was uh, proceeding over massive and widespread corruption. He was, he was, he was in charge of it. They gave him four years in jail. You bury this document. By the way, we just found out last year from an investigative journalist that Jack Butler has still been pulling a pension for the last 20 odd years, even though he's a convicted cop. Right? He also got promoted while he was under investigation up to Detective Chief Inspector. This is how we are treated. Most people don't get involved with miscarriage of justice until it happens to them, and people don't think it's going to happen to them, and hopefully it doesn't happen to anybody. It's never happened to me, I'm one of the lucky ones. Therefore, the grace of God go I. But believe me, the more and more we are gone, it's getting worse and worse. Which is the whole spate of cases of the court death syndrome. Tripti Patel, Don Anthony, uh, Angela Cannon and Sally Clark, and there's about another 29 still coming. Now see if it wasn't for Sally Clark being a middle class, and I'm not being classes, <coughs> if it wasn't the fact that she was middle class, she was a lawyer, her husband was a lawyer, and she had a whole load of friends who were lawyers. Don Anthony, Angela Tan and all these other women would still be banged up and they would still be telling me that evil fucking women that murder their children. And that's way, the way they carry on. Who's going to be held responsible? Well, they're going to blame Roy Meadows. But then the, the Crown are saying, well, it's got nothing, Roy Meadows has got nothing to do with us. He, he was independent, he was an independent expert witness who came in. No, he wasn't an independent expert witness. He was getting paid by the Crown to come in and say his theory. And his theory, the uh, one day's suspicion, uh, one day it's a tragedy, two suspicious, three is murder. <coughs> and then it came out with this uh, Munchausen by proxy syndrome, which is even worse in the sense of the thousands, and I mean thousands of children, who have been taken off their mothers because this theory was being taught to young doctors in the, the, in the hospitals about you see a kid with a bruise, the mother sitting the kid for attention. Could be the kid could be taking fits, the kid just be falling over. Suddenly they're saying, they're taking, see all his notes. God. Scrumpton, he gets, by the way, he gets knighted on that theory. The Labour Party knighted him in 1998 on that theory. 
and he scrubbed all his notes, they're all gone. Burden of proof, this is a new one. In fact, uh, Charles Clark, Plunkett, and Tom Electron just the burden of proof. And everybody's all that meeting going on to the day. All the meetings are going on about moving the burden of proof because of the terrorists the leper brought, were brought under. And by the way, we should be worried about what they're doing there by just locking people up and thinking you can charge them. Saying, no, they're terrorists, but there's no evidence. I mean, this is barbaric. This is the things the Nazis and, and Stalin used to do. This is what the Labour Party are doing in this country today. And it is worrying that people don't go off their asses and start taking no. But that burden of proof is already gone. And the media, once again, when they tell you, I mean, the role of the media in all this is, is crucial, by the way, but it's also crucial in how we work as well, because we also use the role of the media. Because the way we can get to people, and for more, more people to start going out in their workplaces, going out in their communities and talking about the cases, going to courts, sit, sit in a court, when, the, when people are asked to come and sit in a appeal court, is very important, because there's nothing that a judge hates more than to be judged. See when you see the full court, it's not see anymore. See 40, 50 years ago before television came along, did it the court. You know what I mean? Let's all go to the court. Nowadays people don't, everybody's taking their eye off the ball what's happened. And it happened in England three years ago. Barry George, from an Irish family as well, and they're backwards. Barry George has got the IQ of a 40 year old. And I'm not being harsh on the guy. I knew people that knew him years ago, and he was always a loner and a weirdo. And they picked this guy up. And right in front of all of us, it was the biggest trial, the most high profile, because they killed Jill Dando. Every the nation heat heroin, everybody loved Jill Dando. And this guy's met within the Jill, Jill Dando's doorways from here to there. And the time Jill Dando walked in her gate, put a key in the door, the killer had come up, grabbed the body and brought it to the lap line. One shot, quick as a lane. He was there and he was gone. Barry George, and by the way, the gun was one shot, single shot, cleaned out, it had been reactivated, been taken apart, done, it had been cleaned out. It takes a skill, you know what I mean? Good machinists would be able to do it. Barry George couldn't put a light on his bike. Right? Guys and capable of putting a light on the bike. Nobody took any interest in Barry George for two years, for 18 months. The investigation was closing down. Four days before the investigation was closing down, Barry George was lifted. I remember Trevor McDonald, I remember seeing that documentary, Trevor McDonald in the news that night stated that the police had picked up the killer of Jill Dango. He was obsessed by the celebrity, was it? Well, I don't know, do you think of obsession? No, it's, my obsession, obsession is somebody with hundreds of photos of Jill Dango up in the wall and everything. Well, Barry George's flat was, <coughs> it was an absolute tip. There was dust everywhere, you couldn't see the windows were that dirty. There was old newspapers lying up there, hundreds of thousands of magazines. Out of all those magazines, there was like 14 articles of Jill Dando. 14 before her death. After her death, they started collecting more of them, but then a lot of people did after the death, but none before the death. All of it was on Freddie Mercury. That's who he was obsessed with. He called himself Barry Bussara, but he was a child, and he's been convicted. And we don't see the campaign for Barry George. Why is the media, and he's talked to journalists for this case, and they're all alive, you know, he's never said, well, what are you doing about it? What can we do? Write about it. Do something about it. We did a similar case. And this is where they should start getting worried. It's a lack of burden of proof. In Barry George's case, if they actually stated that what's convicted this man is all circumstantial evidence, if put as a whole, it makes a compelling case. <laughs> well, put any circumstantial evidence at all, you could argue a, a, a compelling case. In fact, if you look at the evidence about Barry George that didn't put him at the murder trial that makes him look innocent, it's far more compelling than the evidence which they said was compelling. I mean, the only eye, eye identification witness was something like the, the, the first five 